If you want talk, games, and fun all rolled into one, well, you've come to the right place. This is The Game Show, where host Bradley Clark and his special guests talk about the world of television game and competition shows. But Bradley's guests aren't here to just talk. They came to play a game as well. What will today's topic be? What game does Bradley have planned? There's only one way to find out. It's time to start the show. You heard the man. Welcome to The Game Show. And here's your host, the Bradster himself, Bradley Clark. Doesn't that music just want to make you dance? Thank you so much, Austin Angelo. I'm Bradley Clark, and welcome to another exciting episode of The Game Show, the talk show all about the world of television game and competition shows. Now, do you know that super giddy feeling you get when you have the opportunity to talk with someone that you've always wanted to have a conversation with? Well, I've personally had that feeling a number of times as the host of the game show, but that giddy feeling has definitely doubled today because my guest for this episode holds a special spot on my lifetime game show journey timeline. I'll explain the connection in a few moments, but first, as I like to do for a pre-guest introduction, here are some of the game shows my guest has hosted throughout his incredible television career so far. Four strangers, one goal to win a head-to-head competition for the chance at $100,000. One wrong answer could be their last. This is Russian Roulette. From Santa Monica, California, marble and granite specialist Josh Latzer. From Clinton, Mississippi, singer Maria Lay. From Los Angeles, California, elementary school teacher Lalo Quezada. From Napa Valley, California, second grade teacher Elizabeth Bennett. And now, here's our host, Mark L. Wahlberg. This chair, the only thing that separates a person from $500,000 is 21 questions and their ability to answer each one of these questions with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is there an honest person left in America? Time has come to face the moment of truth. The pilot just turned off the fast seatbelt signs. Do you know why? This is the game plane. Hey everybody, Mark Wahlberg here. We're at 30,000 feet, and that's the perfect altitude to give away cash and prizes. We're gonna lay it all on the line. So let's get this party started. Tonight's mystery cover was discovered while detasseling sweet corn at her summer job. Do you know who it is? Let's play on the cover with your host, Mark Wahlberg. That would be me. Welcome to On the Cover. If you think you know pop culture, you are in the right place. It all starts with a $1 lottery ticket. And tonight, 12 lucky winners of the California Lottery have the chance to win over $1.3 million in cash and prizes. It all happens right here on Make Me a Millionaire. Mark Wahlberg, and welcome to the brand new show from the California Lottery, Make Me a Millionaire. We've got lots of new exciting games to play and plenty of money to be given away. And someone will play for our jackpot, which tonight is at $1 million. But that's not all. He is the host of the PBS show Antiques Roadshow, is the host of the reality show Temptation Island, and was the original announcer and sidekick of Shop Till You Drop. I'm being very truthful when I say that it is a pleasure to welcome him onto the game show. Joining me on the line is a man who takes no shame in dropping people through holes in the floor, Mark L. Wahlberg. Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the game show. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. I wish I could say your name as low as Burton Richardson, but my voice is kind of high. Mark L. Wahlberg. 
That's quite all right. Burton Richardson has a voice that's so low that only certain animals can hear him. That was a whole coaching thing where they wanted him to do it as dramatic as possible. And we all kind of laughed about it because it wasn't my vibe at all. But that was the show. It had a dramatic feel to it. You bet it did. It was dire. Before we start talking about your career, I want to share with you how you've been an influence on my career choice. So when I was in the first grade, after school, I would visit an ice cream shop that was near my house. And I would go there on a daily basis. So the owners knew me well and would let me choose the channel on the TV they had in the shop. Well, one day I walk in and the game show network was on. So as usual, the owner asked me if I wanted the channel changed, but this time I said no. Well, saying no eventually led me to sit there and watch three hours of game shows, and I was hooked. So since seven years old, my dream has been to become a game show host. However, this is where you come into the story. The second show I watched that first day I decided to say no to changing the channel was Russian Roulette, because back then GSN aired reruns of the show at 3.30. So Mark, literally from the day the light bulb went off and I realized that being a game show host is a career path I could choose, you have been someone I've looked up to. So I want to personally say thank you. Well, I am so very flattered and honored by that. Thank you. I love doing that show, and I'm glad it inspired you to pursue it. You saw an opportunity to help America, and that's why you wanted to do it. That's right. (laughs) You know, I have been waiting for the opportunity to talk with you for years, and I'm so glad that today is finally the day. So we're going to take a trip down game show memory lane and talk about a number of the shows that you've been a part of. And then later on for the game of the day, I've created an original Russian roulette theme game just for you to play, Mark. Wow. Okay. I'm excited to play. So, Mark, are you ready to talk game shows with me? I am happy to talk game shows. Sure. Then let's start talking game shows. So I just share for you how my love of game shows first began. But when did your love for game shows first begin? And was game show hosting always a dream for you? Well, first of all, I grew up earlier than you. And so when I was 10 years old and even younger, daytime TV was made up with a lot of network game shows. And I can remember vividly watching them with my grandmother when I would visit her in Miami. I used to tell the joke all the time. I said, my grandmother's the only person I know who broke her coffee table from ringing in. We watched game shows all day long. And so I think that's when I fell in love with them. I've always been a puzzle guy, a game guy. I like playing games. So I always loved game shows on TV. And I had all the great ones through the 70s and 80s that I grew up on. I never really made the choice that I wanted to be a game show host. That was sort of just a series of happy accidents, but it's a job that I really love because I had been a game show nerd from before I even had designs on doing it. It just sort of ended up that way. Now, you began your career as a production assistant for Dick Clark Productions, correct? That's right. Right after I married my wife, who's an actress, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do for a living, and I don't feel comfortable trying to be an actor, so I'll go learn production. And I went to work at Dick Clark Productions. And anywhere you look in show business, even today, you can have people that would say that they went to Dick Clark University, and that's what we all considered it. So that's where I learned TV. Well, it's funny you say that because a lot of friends of mine say that I went to Bob Barker University. Both great professors. That is very true. A lot of great hosts became my television professors, including yourself, and that's how I learned all about game show hosting. Thank you. I'm not on that Mount Rushmore, but I'm glad to be mentioned in the same Senate. Did you ever get a chance to meet Dick Clark? Yes, absolutely. Dick Clark was my first boss, and very early on in my time there, for some reason, Dick knew my name, and it really didn't make a lot of sense. And I ended up being his warm-up guy. I did warm-up for a lot of his shows, including The Challengers, which was a Jeopardy-style trivia game show that ran for a while in syndication. And then after that, I went on and started hosting shows, and I partnered with him on a couple of projects. And he was always a mentor and certainly a role model for me. And then after he passed away, I then became a consultant with his wife, Terry Clark, at Dick Clark Company, which is the second company he started after he sold Dick Clark Productions. And I worked with them and consulted, and we got nominated for an Emmy on a special that we produced together. And so, yeah, very close to the Dick Clark family. Consider him family to me. Little Bradster question for you. Do you know what show The Challengers was a revival of? I didn't realize it was a revival. Yeah, The Challengers was based on the classic 60s and 70s game show, The Who, What, or Where game. Brad fact! It's The Who, What, or Where game! These are the questions our contestants will be answering today, and let's meet them now. Here's our current champion, returning with $3,225, Greg Nowakowski. From West Barrington, Vermont, a homemaker and mother, Mrs. Claire Durst. And New York City's the home of corporate accountant, Mr. John Kibbe. Who, what, or where? That's the name of the game, and now here's your host, Art James. Yes. Thank you very much. 
Christmas, everybody, and welcome to the Who, What, or Where game. Well, we have a fine returning champ, if you've been watching his exploits the last few days. Two great new challengers, a lot of the three W's coming up in one minute, right after this. Interesting. Wow. It was so early in my career, and I was so thrilled to be doing the warm-up, and I remember it was a day-and-date show, and that was a big deal, that they were going to try to do shows that had current topic relevance, which was a challenge. We shot a lot of days. Yeah, the show premiered on Labor Day of 1990, and the announcer would say the date to open the show, and the date was also displayed behind Dick Clark's podium. Brad fact! Today is Monday, September 3rd, 1990. Our champion, Doak Ferry, is on his way to an ultimate challenge worth $55,000. This is a photographer's agent, Charlie Horan. And this is an overseas director for a courier service, Tony Carpenter. Doak is the champion. Charlie and Tony, you are the challengers. And here is your master of the challenge, Dick Clark. Thank you very, very much, and welcome to the challengers on this Labor Day. I hope you've had a good day. This is a new series, as you may know, and I hope you'll be with us for a long, long time. If you caught our sneak preview last week, you know that our champion is Doak Ferry. And on that preview show, Doak won $7,650. Today we're starting off a fresh Doak, and uh, Charlie and Tony will be doing their best to... Uh, knock you out of that position. Nice people, nothing personal. Uh, any player who wins three games in a row will have a shot at our ultimate challenge, which has now grown to $55,000. Yeah, it was a novel approach and not easy to do back then. And I had a great time being the warm-up guy. I used to make jokes at his expense, and he was so sweet about it. I learned a lot, too. That was where I really watched him host, because my approach to hosting, to some degree, I attribute to him that he was a producer who hosted so I would watch him host a game show, but he would be watching a monitor that had the director's cut. And I would literally watch him change how he would host it to make sure the cut would match up and be in sync with the director. It was just phenomenal to watch him work just as a craftsman of making TV. And I learned a lot from him there. As I mentioned during your introduction, you were the first announcer and sidekick on Shop Till You Drop from 1991 to 1994. GSN originally just aired the later versions of the show, so when I first saw an episode of the original Shop Till You Drop on YouTube and heard your voice, you should have seen my shocked face because I recognized your voice immediately, but I'd never known that before Russian Roulette, you were the announcer on one of my favorite game shows. How did you actually land that position? If I told you the story of how I got that job, it's one of many that I could tell you that make no sense. And when you think about you being an aspiring game show host and others who are coming up and doing that, I always say you never know the route. It's never the one you think it's going to be. I was never supposed to do that show. I auditioned to host that show, and they thought I was too young. And so I didn't get the show, and they hired someone else who actually was the same age as me, but he looked like a man. And then I get a call saying, listen, we're shooting the pilot for the show. I know it's awkward because you auditioned for it, but would you be willing to come and do the warm-up? We'll have a small audience. You can be the warm-up guy. And I said, sure, I'm happy to do it. I was early in my career and no ego involved, and I have kids to feed, and I was happy to do it. I had one kid at the time. And so I show up to do it, and when I get there, they say, our announcer isn't booked. So if you'll lay down a scratch track, basically a replacement track of the game show announcing, we'll replace that when we edit it, but it would sure help us out. And I said, sure, I'll do it. How would you like to win the fantasy shopping trip of a lifetime to Rome, Paris, New York, London, or Hong Kong? That's what our contestants will be playing for today on the wildest shopping game ever, Shop Till You Drop! Meet today's challenger. On our first team, she's a pharmacologist and he's a publishing rep. Please welcome Kurt and Debbie Kaplan. He's a photographer, and she's an events coordinator. Please welcome Pam Mori and Mel Cavalier. And now, here's the host of Shop Do You Drop, Scott Carrier. Oh, thank you. So I do that. Then the show gets sent to editing, but before it gets edited, the network sees it at the time, Lifetime Network. And they look at it and say, we like the show. We'll pick the show up. We don't like the prize model. Let's get rid of her. We don't like the host. Let's get rid of him. And let's keep the announcer. And so now I'm the announcer on the show. And they hire Pat Finn to be the host. Then we show up to the first day of taping. And they realized they fired the prize model. So when somebody had to bring a blindfold on, I was the only other union performer on the set. 
because I was supposed to be just an off-camera announcer, so I had to bring the blindfold on. Pat and I kind of did some shtick. I don't even remember. Everybody laughed, and then I became what later we called to wear Mark because he would say he went on vacation of a lifetime to wear a Mark, and then I would do the announcing. One of these lucky couples can win the vacation of a lifetime to one of the shopping capitals of the world, like Rome, Paris, New York, London, or Hong Kong. On the wildest shopping game ever, Shop Till You Drop. And now here's the host of Shop Till You Drop, Pat Finn. Thank you very much. Hello to our studio audience. Good group here today. I hope you're doing great at home. Welcome back into our mall here on our show. You two on the toss. You get to go first. Ready? Please come right over here. Here, let me tell you about this, and if you want, you have the right to pass at this point in the game. Now, we call this stunt No Marks. Over here, we have a grid made of numbered rows and then different colored columns, as you can see. On each position is a picture of a product from our mall. In front of us here, we have two different dice. On one side, we have uh, different numbers, and on the other one, we have colored faces. Now, in a moment, you're going to be rolling one of the dice, which will give us a position on the board. Your job will be to guess the price of that product in that particular position. Now, if you can come within $10 of the actual price, you'll hear this. Otherwise, you're going to hear this, and that means we'll put a mark on that square. Well, actually, we're going to be putting a photo of mark on that square. If you can successfully price five products without getting three marks, you win the stunt. What do you think? Pass or play? We're going to pass. You're going to pass? Okay, head over there. Carolyn Raul, right over here, please. I'll give you the numbers, give you the colors. We'll get Mark out here. All right, let's see the marks that we're putting up there. Very, very nice picture there, Mark. I love that guy. <laughs> Looks like the young Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, it's like my little brother. <laughs> Are you ready? Hey, what do you mean, the young Mark Wahlberg? <laughs> <laughs> when I say go, okay. you'll open up the first box here, Carolyn. You guys have to decide if you're going to keep the item or exchange it. Raul, if you're going to keep it, run it over to our prize table and then hit that bell. As soon as you hear the bell, Carolyn, open up the next box. Okay. If you exchange something, just leave it at any store in our mall. Bring back the box from that store. Now, in the end, we'll add up the retail value of the prizes. And if they add up to $2,500 or more, you two will win the vacation of a lifetime. To where, Mark? Well, get ready, because you're going to shop till you drop in Florence, Italy. Oh. That's right, from the David to Donatello, from the Pizzi Palace to Il Duomo, you'll savor the treasures of the Renaissance, then shop the open markets for the leather and handmade paper in Florence, Italy. So that's how that happened. It was never supposed to go down that way. The original Shop to You Drop ended after three seasons. It was brought back in 96. Were you asked if you wanted to return as the announcer? By 96, I had already had a syndicated talk show, so I was just finishing that up, and I was hosting my own shows. And I remember coming back, and I would have absolutely come back in any capacity because of my friendship with Pat Finn and the producers and everything. But I think I was working on something else, and it never came back my way. And certainly at the time, it didn't seem odd, so I don't really remember the details. But there's never been any animosity about it. It just didn't go my way at that point. I was doing something else. Well, I guess it was the big date, right? Yeah, I think that was the season I did The Big Date, and I just come off of a syndicated talk show. So, yeah, I had my hands full, I think. Well, speaking of The Big Date, I think the most famous moment was when John Hamm, the future star of Mad Men, appeared as a contestant. He didn't leave with a date, but he was on the show. Have you gotten a chance to talk with John since that episode? Oh, no. I've never met John Hamm nor talked about it, but only recently, you know, a few years ago, that clip surfaced and it went viral for a week or so. And all of a sudden, I get this call from Extra or Access or TMZ or something. Can you come in and do an interview with the girl that was supposed to date him? And I did, but I'm sure in the hundreds of episodes of game shows I've done, there have been other famous people that have been contestants. But I didn't even remember doing it with John, so it was interesting to see the clip. Nothing makes me happier than watching two young people become a couple. You may ask me why. Why? Because I was born to be a matchmaker. Yeah. Right. Today, we're going to put a couple together, and when they're together, we're going to send them on the big date. Yeah. Why, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Wahlberg. Welcome to the big date. All of today's players are here because... Well, frankly, they want to hook up with a member of the opposite sex. We're going to do everything we can to make that happen. I have confidence it's going to happen. When they do hook up, they're going to have a chance to go on a really big date that we pay for. <laughs> Temptation lurks behind every door, folks. There's always a chance somebody could find someone they like and then turn around and get dumped by that person, just like real life, right? <laughs> It happens. It happens a lot. Let's meet our first player, Mary Carter. She's 25 years old, computer animation student. 
Mary, over this way, my darling. Thank you. Thank you, darling. You look lovely. Thank you. So you, you look quite dapper yourself. Why, thank you. Just a little something I threw together. You like it? Yes, it's very nice. Got three nice. guys I'm going to bring out in a moment to meet you, but I want to make sure we got the right kind of guys. You know, we took a guess at it. What are you looking for? What's the kind of guy for you, Mary? I need a sexy, hot man who's honest. Honest. I don't want to play games. I'm no. getting too old for that. Are you? Yes. <laughs> and I need someone who knows how to give a good foot massage. Oh. <laughs> That's a, you like somebody rubbing their feet yes, like that. Yes, I love the feet thing. I have a foot fetish. You have a foot fetish? Yes. Well, I'm happy to tell you that all three of the guys we have have feet. Ooh. So, That's and they're going to be here with their feet right now. Say hello to Mark Schaefer. He's a 28 year old stunt man. Mark! Yeah. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hi. Next, say hello to Marcus Miazzo, a 21 year old finance major. Marcus, come on out. There is Marcus. Yeah. Looks like they know something we don't know. John Hamm is next. He's 25 years old. He's a waiter. John Hamm, ladies and gentlemen. How about you, John? You're on a first date, marries the girl. You want to really impress her. How do you make her feel special? Well, start off with some fabulous food, a little fabulous conversation. What else fabulous, John? End it <laughs> with a fabulous foot massage for an evening of total fabulosity. <laughs> ah, very good, John. Well, let's jump ahead now to 2001, when you began hosting the Fox reality show Temptation Island. Now, at the time, Survivor on CBS was such a huge hit, and every other network wanted their own version of the show. When you were presented with hosting Temptation Island, were you worried at all that the show was going to be viewed as just a dating version of Survivor, and you would just be another Jeff Probst? Well, I had concerns, but it wasn't that. I thought it was just the syndicated show Change of Heart on steroids when they first pitched me the idea. I had no problem being the next Jeff Probst or another Jeff Probst. We both came up at the same time, and I was, and am a huge fan of his. I think he's fantastic. So that wasn't a problem. And really, I didn't think about it much more than that. I got a call to come in and sort of improvise an audition for this new show. They told me the premise when I got there. I did some improvisation with the casting director and another producer, and then I left. And then a couple weeks later, they wanted to see me again. And when I came back to the audition, they said, listen, besides the fact that we're interested in you as a host, we really just called you back to see how the episode is because the improv was interesting. So I really didn't think much about it. I thought it was kind of scandalous, but it sounded like a great opportunity. At the time, I was executive producing a really beautiful, sweet show on Odyssey, which is now Hallmark Channel, with my really good friend and partner, Mark DiCarlo. And I was supposed to host that. So when this came up, we had to do sort of a bait and switch where Mark ended up hosting that show, and I produced it. And then I went and did Temptation Island. These four couples have embarked on an incredible journey. Although they're in committed relationships, they've traveled to this remote Caribbean island to become single again, to test their devotion to one another and answer the ultimate question, have I found the one or is there someone better out there for me? Upon their arrival, you will not speak to one another for the next two weeks. They were separated from their mates and sent to opposite ends of the island. There, they were joined by 26 singles, 13 men, 13 women, in search of romance. For two weeks, they will mix, mingle, and date in an attempt to find new connections. In terms of temptations, she was made to order for me. The least compatible singles will be voted off the island. You've reached a decision? This one is a shocker. Only those who our couples are most attracted to will remain. After each date, they will confront their emotions at bonfire. Here, they will be given a choice to see videotape of their partner's experiences on the other side of the island. In the end, each will narrow the field to one with whom they will share an exotic final date. Our couples will reunite on the last night of their journey to confess their experience to each other and decide the fate of their relationships. Who will stay together? Who will be torn apart? Find out as these four couples embark on a once-in-a-lifetime journey here on Temptation Island. But I don't recall really having a whole lot of concern about it other than it seemed pretty outrageous. And at the time, we didn't even know it was going to air. It was just going to be a six-episode test. So you take the job and you go to work. 
Mark DiCarlo, one of the big winners on Sale of the Century. Brad fact. Well, we finish up the game with a speed round. 60 seconds on the clock, please. Mark has been brilliant in the speed round, and he better be now because he is trailing. Howard at 35, Deborah at 30, Mark at 25. We start the speed round. Now, who was Sherlock Holmes faithful to back? Howard? Uh, Mr. Hi. Name Johnny Carson's regular band leader, Mark. Doc Severinsen. Right. And Peter Pan, who was the villainous captain, Deborah. Hook. Right. To Granddad, what was a Pierce arrow? Howard. Car. Right. What part of your body would you place in the care of an orthodontist? Deborah. Your teeth. Right. What type of vegetable is a scallion? Hook. Onion. Right. In the song, what color ribbon was tied around? Hook. Yellow. Right. During the Battle of Trenton, what river did George Washington Howard? Delaware. Right. Who wrote the beloved holiday songs, White Christmas and Mark? Irving Berlin. Right. What number is represented by the Roman numeral M? Deborah. Thousand. Right. In what holy city would you find the Wailing Wall? Jerusalem. Right. Name the English poet and novelist who wrote Gunga Din. Deborah. Kipling. Right. What do you collect if you're a philatelist? Mark. Stamps. Right. What's the term for a poem containing only 14 Mark? Uh... Time! You lose five. Name the committee. Time is up! We've got a tie. We have a tie. Howard, you are out of it. You cannot answer it. It's between Deborah and Mark. Remember, if you answer incorrectly, you lose five, you would lose. Answer correctly, you add five, and you would win. An Indian woman named Sacagawea led Deborah. Pocahontas. No! She led Lewis and Clark! <laughs> Well, Mark, now listen, there's one other thing. Oh, no. You can come back one more time oh, and risk all of this and own the show. No, 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 no. No? no, no, no. Exactly. Well, in that case, you're going to have to say goodbye, and Mark DiCarlo is going to say goodbye with a congratulations. You took a thank great, you, great you. risk. It has paid off. We are all very proud of I you. I had a great time, Jim. Everyone on the show is great. Angela, Lisa, everybody connected with the show. Is, is You're sensational. We wish you well are with you your Are you okay, story. Ma? Are you sitting down? We yeah. wish you well with your theatrical ambitions as well. Thank you very much. Mark DiCarlo leaves us with $115,250. <laughs> congratulations. He and I have a storied and honored past of game show contestant wins. Weakest Link, I also was on Lingo, and I beat Mark DiCarlo on Street Smarts. That's right, I completely forgot about that. Reversing the scenario, in 2014, ABC debuted a spin-off of The Bachelor called Bachelor in Paradise, in which former Bachelor and Bachelorette contestants live at a tropical paradise and try to find love. Now, while the concept of the show is different from Temptation Island, when Bachelor in Paradise premiered, did you think that the show was based off of Temptation Island? I didn't even think twice about that because the show The Bachelor was in response to Temptation Island, I believe. Big Brother came out and was sort of a hit, but not really. Survivor came out and was a mega hit. Temptation Island came out and was a mega hit. And then The Bachelor came out about a year later and was ABC's sort of let's get into the game and became a huge hit. So when Bachelor in Paradise came up, we were already gone for many years. I didn't think twice about it and it made sense. And certainly it was island dating and things like that. But there have been plenty of shows that have that sort of vibe. So I really didn't look at it cynically, let's say. It just seemed like it made sense. And thankfully for Temptation Island fans, the show returned back in January of 2019. I hope you're ready. We're standing in front of you are 24 eligible single men and women. They're all here for one reason. That's to find love. Hopefully, they're going to help you realize whether your partner is the one for you or not. Tomorrow, you'll have a chance to get to know them a little bit better. But right now, I just wanted you to get a chance to see them and let them introduce themselves to you. Because your journey begins right now. Did you not even think twice about wanting to host it again? I didn't think about hosting it again. I read that it was coming back. I made a comment to my wife about it. Isn't that crazy? I didn't think another thing about it. Didn't mention it to my agent. Didn't call about it. Didn't do anything. And then suddenly I got a call saying that the network wanted to meet with me, and I went and had the meeting, and I kind of just shared what my experience was like. I thought maybe they were looking at me more from a consultant standpoint. And it worked out, and thrilled to do it again. I love doing it more now than I did then. I think I have a better perspective with it now than I had when I was younger. Well, what I really appreciated about the production team of Temptation Island was that they brought back the original host, especially in today's television world where there's so many reboots coming back, and the original host of shows, if they're still thankfully here, they don't even get asked. And that's so disappointing to me because these shows are brought back for nostalgia value and they don't ask the host back, which brings nostalgia value. So I'm so glad that they asked you to do it. 
Well, I was happy to slip under the nostalgia line and get the job. And what I found really interesting is while I'm sure I was hired for nostalgic reasons to start, when it aired, I then quickly realized that 90% of the audience had never seen the original. They weren't old enough to watch it at the time. And so I had to sort of win that audience again. And that was an interesting thing, which I was really excited about. So there certainly is a nostalgia factor. And then there's a group of new people watching who are like, this show is great, and had no idea that it was around before. Well, you get both ends of the spectrum, which is great today. Yeah, it's working out pretty good. In 2001, you also appeared as a contestant on a special TV hosts edition of NBC's Weakest Link, in which you were crowned the strongest link. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Now, be honest, Mark. Going up against Mario Lopez in the final round, did you think you had it in the bag based on how many questions Mario was getting wrong throughout the game? Like I said, from the time I was 8, 9, 10 years old, I loved playing games. So I was excited to play. So I wasn't very intimidated by anybody there. But I tell the story that the last three players were me, Mario Lopez, and Ben Stein. And I remember during the commercial, Mario looks over at me and kind of makes a point at Ben Stein and a slash under his throat like we got to vote him off. And so I immediately vote Ben Stein off. And when I did that, I realized I could have made a critical error right there. I thought if Ben Stein and I go to the final round, in other words, if I vote off Mario, and I lose, well, I'm losing to Nixon's speechwriter. He's a brilliant man. And if I win, it's I'm a hero. But if I lose to Slater from Saved by the Bell, there's no coming back from that. So that was a little bit of a concern. When we got into the final round, the story of how I won that game is one of the craziest in my life. The day before I was taping, I was driving my car, and my son, who was very young at the time, was in the backseat. I was on the phone with somebody, and my son keeps saying, as kids will do, Dad, 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 what's a million times a million? And I said, I have no idea. And he says, well, it's a trillion. It's the number one followed by 12 zeros. We get down to the final question with Mario Lopez and me and Ann Robinson. He asked me, Mark, what is the American word for the number one followed by 12 zeros? And that's how I won the game. That's so crazy. I thought the craziest question was, your first question of the third round was, in television, who was the original host of the $10,000 pyramid? I certainly hope I got it right. You did. You correctly said Dick Clark. Thank God. I would have been banished from the kingdom at that point. Well, then also in the final round, one of your questions was, in movies, what real-life game show host played television personality Damon Killian in The Running Man? That one is Richard Dawson, I think, isn't it? That is correct. Yeah, Richard Dawson. But it's so funny how you got two game show-related questions. Right. I'm glad I got it right. I forgot. That tells you how old I am. I forgot I even was asked that. How crazy really is Weakest Link? Because the clock's running, you're thinking about saying bank, you need to make sure that you get as much money as possible in the round so you don't get dissed by Ann yeah, Robinson. Crazy. I had a strategy going in. Just be invisible. Lay low so she doesn't pick on you. And that worked for a couple rounds. We're all playing for charity. I was the only one who had actual board members from the charity in the green room waiting to collect. And it's very fast-paced. So if you're not used to playing trivia, you could probably get behind a little bit. During one of the talkbacks, Anne asked you if you were famous for something, and you replied, you don't think you're famous for anything. Do you still stand by that? Do you think you're famous for anything now? <laughs> what a good question that is. In the sense of what I consider famous to be, I'm nowhere near famous. So, yes, I would say that that's true. What I consider famous to be in the sense of what fame is, I'm so low on that measurement that whatever recognition comes my way or notice or attention comes my way is just a delicious little taste and thank you very much, and then I go back to being invisible. Well, you're high on my famous totem pole. Well, thank you very much. There are a few of you out there that surprise me, and then I'm always flattered. So now is the time that I'm getting so pumped for. We're going to talk about Russian roulette. Okay. It aired on GSN from 2002 to 2003. Let me first ask you the question that many of the listeners will probably want to know, many fans of the show want to know. How many feet did the contestants fall and where did they go? That is a question I got asked in airports and still get asked quite regularly. Well, I'm 5'10". So if I jumped in the hole and stood there, there would probably be about another four or five inches above my head before you would see it. Maybe more. So maybe six feet, six and a half foot drop. And then what you land on is a three- or four-foot-high track and field crash pad with two guys under there to catch you in case you fall off of that. But it's a big mat under each of the holes, and it's a pretty easy ride as long as you just fall on your bum. For fun, did you purposely ever drop through a drop zone? Many times. That, to me, is our version of spinning the big wheel of Price is Right. It's sort of a bucket list thing. What were your initial thoughts when you first got asked to host a show where contestants fall through holes in the floor? Well, at the time, my friend Bob Bowden was the executive at Gamester Network, 
And this crazy Scandinavian, Gunnar Wedderberg, I met, had this greatest energy. He was awesome. This had been his baby, and he'd sold it internationally, and now they were trying to develop it from Gator Network. So when I came in for run-throughs, I remember doing the run-through and thinking, I'm not doing a very good job with this. But I literally said to Bob and Gunnar, I said, but I'll totally get it by the time we take. And it was fun. And a lot of the rules we didn't quite have down yet. So that was being workshopped, and I was sort of in that conversation. So it was really fun. I was really excited about it. I thought it was adorable and fun and like nothing we'd seen in a while and didn't know it was going to make it on the air. And then when it did, it was one of the funnest shows I've done as far as game shows go. We got to do a lot of episodes. We do six in a day. The crew was great. The director was great. Burton was great. The network was great. We had a wonderful time. I've actually had the pleasure of having Bob Bowden on the game show, and he's such a nice guy and full of so much game show knowledge. That's the Mount Rushmore guy. One of the things that I really admired about Russia Roulette was that the top prize was $100,000. I think it was the highest amount in cable ever at the time. Back when we did Russia Roulette, 5000 was the number, 10000 maybe on some shows, I think. So it was a big swing for the fence and something they did not really want to have happen too often. And it happened, I want to say, three times altogether. You're right, three times it happened. I could literally hear them freaking out of the booth when it was happening. My favorite $100,000 winner was a contestant named Maria because she had the least favorable odds to win it since she only had one safe zone. But thankfully, the safe zone landed on her zone after she pulled the handle and she became $100,000 richer. You got all 10. $10,000 is yours. You now have $12,000, which is yours. However, you have an option that not many people standing on this zone get a chance to do. There are five drop zones. There's one safe zone. Okay? Not a bad gamble, one out of six, if you figure that $12,000 could be $100,000 if you survive, right? The $2,000 is yours to keep. The $10,000 you'd give up. You pull that handle, spins around. If you find the one zone that's not red, you walk down that bridge, $100,000 richer. So, Maria, the question is to you. What do you want to do? I told myself before I even came here today, I came here with nothing. If I leave with nothing, I will have lost nothing. So I'm going to go for it. Okay. All right. We're going for $100,000. As of this point, we say goodbye to the $10,000. You've just won. The $2,000 is yours to keep no matter what. We will now close and reset all of the drop zones. And we will cross every finger and toe we have. There is one drop zone that wins you money, five drop zones that gives you a quick exit. All right? Ready to do this, Maria? Let's do it. For one hundred thousand dollars. I'm crazy. Let's play Russian roulette. Okay, when you're ready, pull that handle down and let's see what happens. played Russian Roulette and lived to talk about it. Maria, congratulations. We are so happy for you. That's all the time and money we have for today. Join us next time for the Ultimate Game of Chance. Mark Wahlberg saying until we see you again, watch your step, girl. That right there sums up why we, you and I, and hopefully your listeners, are complete geeks when it comes to game shows. If you were playing, how many safe zones would you need to feel confident enough to risk $10,000 and try for $100,000? That's a hard question. Three, that's a definite. 50-50 chance, you've got it. Two, I may roll the dice. I'm willing to lose 10 to win 100. One, I'm probably taking the 10. One of my biggest Russian roulette curiosities has always been, why did the value of round three questions go from $300 each in season one down to $250 each in season two? I can't speak to that because I don't remember that, but I will say as a game show producer, 
the math of the money and sort of the art and science of what numbers feel right and how it needs to escalate and what's fair is a huge issue that we grapple with all the time. I have pages in my office of shows that I've developed where I'm just writing down all possible ways this money could break down and how do we make this prize ladder the right numeric values. And it is common in game shows, as you, I'm sure, are well aware that after you do a season of them and they're on the air, you have time to contemplate and you tweak rules and stuff to make it either more streamlined or take care of flaws that may have been exposed. And can't recall right now why that change would have been made, but it's certainly not odd for that to happen. I'm probably the only person who will ever say that I actually love to analyze different game show money ladders. I find them very fascinating to compare and contrast. Well, I've spent many hours doing it, so yes, I don't know if I love it, but I don't dislike it. Well, I find it interesting because money ladders are common on game shows, so it's fun for me to identify the differences, especially when money amounts from past shows are relatively similar to present shows. Right. And at what point does the amount change your decision process if there's a decision of going forward or not? So that line of where it becomes dire, where it forces the contestant into a difficult decision, from a creative standpoint, that's a really difficult issue when it comes to a money ladder. You want to make sure that the jeopardy escalates at a proportional way. And also you want the numbers to be something that sounds right. The incremental jumps have to be significant enough for the backbone of the game show to continue to play. And then the other conversation as producers you grapple with is how punitive do you want to make things? Is it satisfying enough to have them lose half their money, or should it be a bigger penalty? Like, for instance, the original millionaire, where you reach certain plateaus and that money becomes safe at that point. Where are those, and at what point is the risk? All that stuff I really enjoy doing, but it's like a puzzle. It's like a game show within a game show. Right. Well, that's one of the great things about Russia Roulette was that you risk the $10,000, but the incentive is that you still keep the money you got from the main game. So you're not risking everything. So it's an incentive also for the contestants to say, well, at least I've won $2,000 already. Why not right. go for it? If not, no one would ever go for it because the odds are not in your favor at the end of that round. It's a long shot. As 100000 in that day should have been. It should be a long shot. It should be a real roll of the dice. Are you hoping to ever see Russia Roulette come back? And would you like to host it? Every now and then I get a tweet or somebody saying they need to bring it back, reboot this one. And my answer is, let's go. I am ready. Watch your step. I'm ready to go right now. Love that show. Really fun. And there have been versions of shows similar with drops. Ellen did one, and there was a couple other ones that are even more escalated where you exit the show in a dramatic fashion. But something clean about Russian Roulette and has that nostalgia factor, and I'd be happy to do it again. It was fun. Well, if I ever had the opportunity to be a part of it, I will gladly help you get Russia Roulette literally off the floor. <laughs> Very well played, sir. Very well played. Off the floor is where you want to be with Russian Roulette. Well, it's funny that you brought up the different shows because I wanted to talk to you about that. So in 2011, NBC debuted a primetime game show called Who's Still Standing, in which right. contestants would fall to the floor if they didn't beat their opponent in a trivia battle. Now, when I saw this premiere, the first thing I thought of was that it's kind of a ripoff of Russia Roulette. Why is this interior designer losing it? What has this property manager feeling so defeated? I'm going down like a sweet muffin. Why is this journalist trembling with fear? I'm so scared. I don't want to go. They're all about to fall through the floor. Look out below. This is High Stakes Trivia. This is Who's Still Standing? One hero versus ten total strangers in a series of intense head-to-head -head trivia battles. Miss just one question, and you'll fall through the floor. If the hero drops all ten strangers, he will win one million dollars. Did you ever get a chance to watch the show? And if so, did you think it was a Russian roulette ripoff as well? Of course, the comparisons make sense. And yes, I watched an episode or two just because I like to watch. But when you're developing game shows and as a host for years, I get called in when other people are developing games just to host the run through. So I see games in all different levels of development. And often you'll find three or four games simultaneously that have the same idea, sort of this mental cosmic connection that people come up with the same idea in different parts of town at the same time. That happens more than you would think. But the other thing is that there are certain game show mechanisms that have been adapted and adopted and used in many incarnations on many game shows. 
prisoner's dilemma like you saw in Friend or Foe, where at the end you make a choice of whether you're going to split it or not. That dilemma, the secret ballot, that's been done on a million shows. Listen, we were rushing roulette. You dropped to the floor. But before that, on remote control, they went through the back of a wall in a lazy boy. So one could say that we were derivative of that. I just found that there are plenty of great ideas. And when you make yourself crazy about who came up with it first and this is a ripoff of that, at the end of the day, if the game is fun to play and people are enjoying it, let's just keep making up games. Well, just so you know, every time someone talks to me about the know or go portion from Ellen's Game of Games that you mentioned, since it's essentially the same concept of people falling through the floor if they get a trivia question wrong, I tell my friends the whole history of Russian Roulette and how it was the first game show to drop contestants through the floor. So, Mark, I am keeping the Russian roulette name alive. Well, I appreciate that. And now, more than ever, I'm aware that everything old is new again. So I never say never on anything now. Next up, I want to talk about a great game show in my mind, but a lot of people don't know about it. On the cover, which was on PAX in 2004. I love that show, and I wish that it would have lasted longer. It was a strange time at PAX, and the producers, we did the show. We taped, gosh, I want to say a week or two of shows. It aired, and the day after it aired, it was pulled from the air. And then four months later, they called me in to redo the pilot, and then we were back on the air. And I don't really remember a whole lot of the details there, because as the host, you're not in there producing it. But yeah, that was a rocky start for the show that ended up being pretty cute after we kind of retooled it. Yeah, because there were some noticeable differences between the pilot episode and how the game played when on the cover went on the air. That's right. I still love the opening of every episode when the announcer would say something like, Tonight's mystery cover once worked at Dunkin' Donuts as a jelly squirter. Do you know who it is? Let's play On The Cover! Wow, you sound great. Well, thank you. It truly means a lot coming from you. But I still have to introduce you to the show, which your host, Mark Wahlberg! Wow, you know, you may be onto something. You sound like a pro. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Tonight's mystery cover once worked at Dunkin' Donuts as a jelly squirter. Do you know who it is? Let's play On The Cover! So next up, I want to talk about one of the most controversial shows to ever air on television, The Moment of Truth. It's the show everyone in America has been talking about for the last three months, and it's finally here. It is the simplest game on television. One participant, 21 questions, and all that is required is the willingness to tell the truth. Have you ever thought that your boyfriend, Jeff, might be gay? Blame your father for tearing your family apart. Is there a part of your husband's body that repulses you? Do you really care about starving children in Africa? Have you ever helped someone smuggle something into the country? Have you ever been paid for sex? $500,000, people are willing to expose everything about themselves, their families, their lives. Have you ever gambled away one of your children's college funds? Do fat people repulse you? Have you ever had sexual relations with my sister? This is no ordinary game. Have you ever suspected your wife of cheating on you. Would you donate a kidney to save your father's life? Get ready, America. What? The moment is finally here. Do you think you will still be married to your husband five years from now? It's the most anticipated show in the country. And it starts right now. It ran on Fox for two seasons from 2008 to 2009. Now, personally, I love Moment of Truth. I still watch some of the episodes that are on YouTube. I find it riveting. Now, when you were presented with the concept of the show and you heard that the whole point of the game was for individuals to reveal personal information about themselves, to win money, did you have any hesitation about the show? Well, here's another one of those crazy stories. Some people call this one urban legend, but I'm here to tell you it's the truth. 
it was never like that. The way it went down was I was shooting a game show pilot for a different game show that had to do with antiques, actually. And I was shooting at a studio in Hollywood. It was a Friday. And I started at 8.30 in the morning, and it wasn't going very well. And I was sort of writing on the fly as it went because it was pretty disorganized. And by the time the show finished, I was pretty exhausted. So rather than taking off my suit and washing my face and getting my makeup off, I said, you know what, I'm just going to drive home. So I'm walking out to my car, and a dear friend of mine called me and said, hey, we're doing this pilot for NBC. We just fired our host. How quick can you get here? They want you. And I said, where are you? He said, I'm at Sunset Gower. I said, well, I can be there in five minutes. So I drive around the block, and he greets me at the door, and I watch the other host walk to his car. And then I get out of the car, and they're telling me all about the show. And I walk right in, put a microphone on. I'm already in makeup. And I sat down before I even knew what the name of the show was and started hosting the show. And so I did the pilot and didn't think more about it. I thought it was crazy, but I literally just kind of jumped right in at 10 at night, and it was done by midnight. And then I came home and I said to my wife, you'll never believe what happened. There's no way I'm ever hosting this show. This is too crazy. I don't think this is for me. I had already done Temptation Island. And while people had loved that originally, there was also some fallout with that. And anybody who knows me knows that I'm a pretty normal dude. And I was doing these crazy wild shows. They weren't necessarily what my vibe was, but I was able to navigate them well. And what I later looked at is there are shows like Temptation Island and Moment of Truth that have this horrible edge that if the host takes delight in the misery of the people, it's too hard to watch. But if the host can empathize with we're not so different from these people and find some humanity in it, then it becomes palatable. And you can go with an edgier show because there's some humanity to it. So NBC passed, and they took the pilot and apparently sold in 20 countries around the world. And then Fox picked it up, and I had had a relationship with Fox from the original Temptation Island and some other stuff I'd done there. So the president of the alternative and reality division, Mike Darnell, called me and said, hey, you got to do this show. And I'm like, no. And so he said, I tell you what, let me send you over the pilot. You watch it with your family and call me back. So they sent over the pilot. I watch it with my family. And I watched them watch it, and they were immediately into this engaged conversation about what would you do or what would you do and what wouldn't you do. I went, wow, this show's probably going to be pretty good, and maybe there's something I can bring to it. And I kind of saw the value in doing the show, and that's how it happened. After you taped the first episode, did you say to yourself, I'm so glad I made this decision, or did you have second guesses again because of what actually transpired? I just don't think of it that way. I was trying to do my best work and trying to be as authentic as I could be. And I was grateful that it was doing well. It became the highest rated show scripted or non-scripted on any network that season. So that was overwhelming and unexpected. It was a show that required some actual hosting. And while the subject matter may not have been my first choice, there may have been some loftier ideas I would have liked to have done, it still required a host. It wasn't just reading questions and getting out of the way. You had to really jump in there. And similar to what I do on Temptation Island. So for that, I was grateful. And I enjoyed that part of it. Did you see the questions beforehand or was the first time you saw the questions when you asked them? I could see them beforehand, but I chose not to read them beforehand. I would sit with the producer and say, all right, so what's the basic story behind this? And they would tell me basically the story. And then they say something like, when you get to question 15 or so, there's a big one and it's an issue about blah, blah, blah. So I might have taken a peek at that. I had no idea what the answers were. But for the most part, I would say 80% of the questions I didn't read until you saw me read them on TV. Every time I watch an episode of The Moment of Truth, I always think about the writers and how difficult it must be to come up with such personal questions that would draw out information and make moments out of the contestants. You underestimate how willing people are to say the most intimate things on TV. I think what happens is you find people, you pre-interview them like you would with any talk show. So you learn things about their story because they're happy to tell you. And then we would give them a 50-question lie detector test. And from those 50 questions, they would pull the 21 for the show. So after they shared what their story was, that had a lot to do with what questions they came up with to ask them. And then when they saw those questions, they were able to format them into a show. Did you ever think a contestant would go all the way and win the half a million dollars? I said early on, if no one does, there's no reason to offer it. It has to be won. You have to be able to win it. There was a big difference of opinion once the show got on the air and became a hit. I thought, and there were others that felt this way, that there was so much depth to explore in the gap between what people think is true about themselves and what is actually true about themselves. And that all shades of that could be part of the show. So every now and then you need somebody who's really honest and really truthful and really great. We cheer for them. And then sometimes it could be comical and sometimes it could be more intellectual. But what I remember saying to the producer after we started one right after another, as hard as we could, I said, we want a 10-year run of this show, but the network wants a hot 10 weeks. And that's pretty much how it changed. We immediately went from doing 
a show like Millionaire where if they lost, we would start a new story mid-show and go into the next one. And instead, they just took the juiciest ones and stretched out as full episodes. And it took a turn. And I feel like there were years of possibility of a show that could have been both tragic and uplifting, depending on the people that you book. But they really just wanted the train wreck. So that's what they got. And it ran its course. They would do teases within the body of the show that belied the gameplay. So the question you're asking now, you already know they must have gotten it correct or they would have been out. So there was a lot of that. It became more of a sensational talk show, and the gameplay became secondary. And, of course, as a game guy, that didn't really jive well with me. And it was always we would be doing a show that was promoted as the most controversial show ever. And during that show, you would have the promo for next week saying, and the most controversial episode yet. It was like, come on, we can't do this every week. But, again, I wasn't a producer. I was just hosting the show. Well, one of my biggest complaints about today's game shows, especially the big money primetime ones, is that the beginning teaser on each episode spoils basically the whole episode. Because if you're a fan of the show and know how the game works, you can easily figure out what's going to happen for the majority of the episode in the first minute of the show. And I always say, what's the point of watching the whole episode when I can watch the first two minutes and the last two minutes and understand the entirety of the contestant's game? You're hitting on a conversation that's as old as the game show world. I've been in TV for decades now. And you're hitting on this divide in television between TV producers and game show producers. And there's always discussion over the years between those who like drama and the content fun part and those who say you can't have that without the integrity of the game being solid. And so you would constantly have this push-pull between producers saying, oh, well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is it's funny. And then guys like me would say, yeah, well, you have to be funny, but if the game doesn't work mathematically and if it's not legit, you lose the entire audience. There have been so many shows that have come on the air that you think the gimmick is the answer, but I always say that those people who have been successful with game shows develop a game that almost works with a paper and pencil first, and then you add the bells and whistles. When you start adding rules, or bells and whistles to a game to fix it, you're already in trouble. If the game doesn't play like Hangman on a piece of paper, then all the bells and the whistles won't do a thing for you. So that's the kind of stuff that drives game show guys like me crazy is when you do stuff that belies the actual integrity of the gameplay, even in the most absurd context, then you lose a big portion of the audience. Some like you who recognize it for what it is, and a lot subconsciously because they don't understand why it doesn't matter. An example was, and I'm going to get in trouble by saying this, but there was a show that Ryan Seacrest did, Knock Knock Live, and it was apparent to anyone watching that it wasn't particularly live, and when the people would come out of the house to do whatever the gameplay was, there was no integrity to the gameplay, so you knew they were just going to get a gift. And the show lasted two episodes, and I felt like if it's not real, if there's not actual jeopardy of losing or winning, and if you're saying live, it's got to be real, then the audience smells and it's less fun. And I see that mistake happen all the time. Like I said, it's a perennial argument. It's been going on since the beginning of game shows. And where it gets tricky is when you get into shows that have an element of, I'm going to distract you while you're trying to do this or stuff like that. It has to be quantifiable. So when you do stuff that's stick or gimmick that's supposed to affect the gameplay, but it doesn't, it's not quantifiably affecting the gameplay by an actual number or a time amount or something like that, then it's just lipstick on a pig. The only person to ever win the half a million dollars was a contestant named Melanie Williams. Was that one of the episodes that went unaired? I have to assume. We shot a second season, and then the stock market crashed in 2008. Or at least that's the story I got. And advertisers pulled, and there was a whole real scare. And that season really never aired. And there were some really great episodes, if you like Moment of Truth. So the second season was better, but there's a whole vault worth that never saw the light of day. Yeah, so she was asked a question regarding her father, who was a polygamist. And not only was she the first person to ever make it to $350,000, she was the first person to ever go for the final question and win the half a million dollars. Brad fact! Thankfully, the clip is on YouTube, so I've been able to see it. For $500,000, Melanie Williams, question 21. Do you believe your father, as an adult, has ever had sexual relations with a minor?
Yes. That answer is... First person ever to make it through 21 questions truthfully. It wasn't easy, but hopefully that half a million dollars is worth the pain and effort. Did you ever imagine that a contestant would risk $350,000 on one true or false question just to gain another $150,000? Well, first of all, it goes back to our earlier discussion about math. That money ladder was in high discussion because if that last decision isn't weighted correctly, you'll never make that decision. So that was typical game show stuff right there. The moment of truth money ladder is one that I always found interesting because it started out with a $10,000 level and then a typical game show increase from $10,000 up to $25,000. But then it jumped to $100,000. And those four questions in that level were usually the questions that would trick people up and I guess you maybe figure that after $100,000, people might stop. Those were very personal questions, and those were like the meat of the episodes. Right. That's where they built the drama to be, is that they breeze through the first few questions, and then you get to the point where you've got some money now, and whether you get it right or wrong, what's about to be asked, you may not want on TV, or at least that's the conceit of the show. Knowing that all of these questions you knew were on the sheet because you've answered them already. So you don't know which ones we chose, but you knew what it could be. And I've said to them, look, you don't know what question is, but you know what it could be. And think of the worst one on that test. This is it. And I found on that show particularly, which is often the case, what you and I would do is not what contestants would do. And sometimes I think that contestants choose to go on a show because it will force them to say something that they wouldn't have said. It would certainly make more sense and probably more responsible to tell that person directly at home, maybe with a therapist. But I think sometimes people make that choice because it forces them to say stuff that they can't say. In season two, there was a rule change in which once a contestant reached $25,000, that money was safe and could not be lost. Because back in season one, if a contestant lost after the $25,000 level, they would go home with nothing. Would you happen to know why this rule change was put into effect? Because I'm very curious about it. I don't recall, and I probably wasn't consulted. At the time, I probably had a very specific opinion about it. Sadly and gratefully, I've done so many shows over my lifetime that I sometimes forget the minutia of the rules, and I would have to sort of be a student of my own work to watch episodes and remind myself. And I'm sorry to tell you that while I do like to watch game shows, I rarely watch myself, so I don't remember. No worries at all. It's just another one of my obscure game show curiosities that I have. I love that you're passionate about it and you've got these questions. I'm a little embarrassed that I don't have those answers. I always tell this story. My wife was in the original Friday the 13th movie, and she gets these fans who ask her detailed questions about the movie, and she's like, I worked on it for two days. I don't really remember. I feel like we had a responsibility not to disappoint those hardcore fans, and I certainly don't want to, but at the same time, some of the details that you aficionados remember and research have gone by the wayside for me. I love that there's a passion, and I run into fellow game show nerds like me all over the place, and it's sort of like a secret handshake. We're all in the same club. Well, speaking from personal experience, one of the greatest aspects of the game show community is that many of the members, including myself and yourself, know the history of the genre and love what they do. You bet. To close out the moment of truth, I want to talk about probably the most famous episode of the show, which featured a contestant named Lauren Cleary. That's when I realized... I may be the most gullible person on the set because to me, every episode was a big deal. I was worried about 
how people would react and concerned about their well-being and really took it very seriously. And then I remember doing that episode, which I said to the producers, I really am not behind this. I think it's too far. And then they turned that on me by making me say to the audience, this episode I asked the producers not to air, but they aired it anyway, which makes me promote it anyway. Welcome to a special Monday night edition of The Moment of Truth. This episode was so controversial, it sparked a long debate as to whether or not to air it at all. Quite honestly, if I had my vote, it would not air. It is the most uncomfortable I've ever been on television, asking these questions and listening to the answers that were given. But in the end, it was decided that this episode should air. I will tell you, however, that the truth is often not pretty. So here it is. This is the moment of truth. And then I'm all upset about it, and then we do the episode, and afterwards, the boyfriend, the husband, and Warren wanted to take a picture with me together. So I was like, wait a minute, am I the only sucker here? And this was right after she left the game with nothing on what I thought was an easy question to answer. Do you think you're a good person? Question 17. Do you think you're a good person? Honestly, I think I am a good person. So your answer is? Yes. That answer is... It's true. It's true. False. Lauren, I am so, so sorry. Why do you think this came up? as a lie for you when I asked you if you think you're a good person. Because even after everything that I have done, stealing the money and everything, I think that I've become a better person. That's why I think I am a good person. Yet it came up as a lie, which means that somewhere in you, you haven't forgiven yourself. And you, somewhere, your truth is that you don't think you're a good person at all. Why don't you go out and hang out with your family? And I thank you very much, Lauren, for being on the show. I wish you the best. Well, see, now you bring up the crux of how that show works is that the factual stuff, you know if you cheated or not. You know that answer. What you don't know is, do you think you're a good person? Because what the lie detector professes to measure is your response to a question. So while you may say, yeah, I think I'm a good person, subconsciously you may not feel that way and you may have a reaction. And that's where there's just no way to predict that. Do you still stand by what you said, that it was the most uncomfortable you've ever been on television? I stand by that it was one of the most, but I've had some recent ones on Temptation Island that have been very raw and very deep and very real that parallel or at least rival. And you're still happy that they aired the episode? One of the things you got to get okay with very quickly in the business is, as the host, you don't have any control over any of that. And to think that you do is a waste of energy and will make you crazy. So I do what I can to do the best I can in the moment. And what happens after that, I don't have control over. Currently, you are the host of The Price is Right Live, which is a traveling stage show of America's longest running game show. And just for you, Mark, I'm wearing my Cliffhangers Yodely Guy shirt as we speak. Now, I've certainly dreamed numerous times about being able to host The Price is Right, especially since I know all of the games and have hosted the show at home and for class projects. I've even said that out of all of the game shows currently on the air, The Price is Right is the one I would love to host the most because I love the audience participation aspect of the game. Was The Price is Right a dream game show gig for you as well? Well, it certainly was a fun thing. Everybody loves that show, and doing a live show is fun because I love the audience, and doing The Price is Right is an American institution, so I still feel that same way about it. What's your favorite pricing game? I used to like It's in the Bag. I have a great time with Punch a Bunch, but they're all really fun to do. Plinko, of course, everybody loves. My favorite is Punch a Bunch, actually. Yeah, I like Punch a Bunch. We have a good time with that. It opens our show, and it's fun to play around with. Did you already know how to play the games as a fan, or were you told how to play them? No, I didn't know how to play the games. I'd certainly seen a lot of them, but I didn't know how to play them. But, you know, when you host the volume of numbers of games I've hosted in my life, 
you start getting into game show pattern. You know how to get the rules of the game. You basically hear it from the producer and you say, okay, I got it. The words are there because you talk like a game show host. So it wasn't difficult for me to learn the games and it's not difficult to play the games. And it's very important when you're hosting any game show to be a master of the game itself because stuff goes down. And like I said, the integrity of the game matters. So when a clock is on it or pricing is on it, you have to be exact. But that stuff is very easy for me. It's something I've spent my whole career doing. So to me, that show, I do it for fun, just all out fun. Well, I hope that one day I can join the list of people who have hosted an incarnation of The Price is Right. I hope so. Well, thank you so much. I truly appreciate you saying that. So next, I want to briefly talk about Make Me a Millionaire, which was a California lottery game show. And what was interesting about Make Me a Millionaire was that it replaced The Big Spin, which ran for 23 years. And the last host of The Big Spin was none other than Pat Finn. It all starts with a $1 lottery ticket. And tonight, 12 lucky winners of the California Lottery have the chance to win over $3.3 million in cash and prizes. And it all happens right here on Make Me a Millionaire. He heard that he wasn't going to be doing the new version of it. And he's the one who said, well, if I'm not doing it, I want you to do it. So he kind of put a word in for me there. Pat is one of my dearest friends. He is one of the best people you will meet in the business. He is as fine a man as anybody you'll ever meet. Do you remember the moment when a contestant on Make Me a Millionaire won $2.8 million? Because that's one of my favorite 21st century game show moments. I can't say I remember that specifically, but I do remember being very grateful to do a show that regularly changed people's lives, that you could just see it happening. This is the moment where their life changes forever. And that's another sort of intrinsic thing about being a game show host that's pretty special. You could total up how many things you've given away, how much money you've given away, how many people's lives have been changed for the better by the things they've won. That's pretty fun. Glad to be part of that. (laughs) All right, here's how this works. Josephina, in front of you are 11 orbs. Each one generates a number between 1 and 50. Okay, we're going to start the first one spinning right now. And all you need to do is select our first number by hitting that button whenever you're ready. 49 is your first number, and just by doing that, you've earned $10,000. I have a feeling you know how this works. I'm going to ask you if you think the next number is higher or lower. Every time you're right, I'll give you $10,000. If you make it all the way to the end before making two mistakes, it's $2.8 million. So, higher or lower? Lower. Lower, whenever you're ready. Lower, and a good low number. You now have $20,000. Let's spin the third orb. Higher or lower? Higher. Higher, whenever you're ready. $30,000. 40 is the next number. Let's spin the fourth orb. Higher or lower? Lower. Whenever you're ready. She says lower. Lower. Josephina, you have $40,000 so far. Five is the number. Higher, good luck. Higher. Now, look how far you've made it. $50,000. Let's spin the next number. You have no mistake yet. Higher or lower? Lower. Good luck. Let's see a low number. Lower. You're on your way. You are more than halfway to $2.8 million. Higher or lower? Lower. Good luck. Josephina, $70,000, four more right, $2.8 million, higher or lower? Higher! Good luck. (laughs) Josephina, that's $80,000, you haven't made a mistake, 46 is your number, higher or lower? Lower! Good luck. Josephina, we are so close. Let me tell you what we have. We have $90,000. No mistakes. Two more. You win our grand prize of $2.8 million. Higher or lower? Good luck. Josephina, come here. You have no mistakes. One more orb. If you are right, it's $2.8 million. So, Josephina, higher or lower? Lower! If this is right, 
You are a very, very rich woman, Josephina. Whenever you're ready. In 2014, you hosted The Game Plane, which was a game show that took place during an actual airplane flight. And if you ask me, the right way to fly is by either hosting or being a contestant on a game show. The pilot just turned off the passenger seatbelt sign. Do you know why? This is The Game Plane. Hey, everybody, Mark Wahlberg here. We're at 30,000 feet, and that's the perfect altitude to give away cash and prizes. We're going to lay it all on the line. So let's get this party started. Big, long nose. Woo! Yeah. My mother made them all the time. Chocolate chip cookies. Swirling vortex of death. <laughs> That's awesome. Something that I love to chew on. Your nails. That is an award-winning goatee you got going there. How long have oh, you been growing you. that? About six months. Can we give him money for that? <laughs> Mixing paints. <laughs> we are going to remember this forever. I love the gameplay. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on the game plane. There you go. We'll be right back with the game plane right after this. Yeah, that was a show that a friend of mine had developed, and there was a host that had done it, and they asked me to do the second season. I'll tell you, it was a great idea. It was very difficult to execute, very hard to host, grueling days, but another fun chapter. The final game on each episode of the game plan was called The Big Deal, which involved two contestants competing against each other to see how many cards they can predict were higher or lower than the previous one. Of course, the title of the round, The Big Deal, is also the final portion of Let's Make a Deal. And the concept of the game was just like Card Sharks because it's a high-low card game. Leon was our big winner, so he chose to go second. He wants the ABC side of the plane. Tara's going to play the DEF side of the plane. And we're going to meet who you're playing with in a moment because I see this dude has joined you. I'm guessing that's your husband? Yes. What's his name? Uh, this is Robert. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Glad you're here. All right, here's what you guys are playing for. An eight-day vacation to the Grand Canyon and Zion National Park. Explore the greatest national parks in the Southwest on a fully guided eight-day tour, plus a thrilling Jeep ride through Monument Valley from Caravan.com. Here's how this works, Tara. I'm going to show you a playing card. Tell me the next card is higher or lower. All right. Whoever gets the most cards right is going to win our grand prize. Okay? Terry, you're going first because Leon wanted to go second. Let's take a look at the first card. It is a four of spades, higher or lower? Okay, um, yeah, higher. They're gonna go higher, let's see it. Yeah, king. Yes. Lower. Yeah, I, I agree, lower. Is it lower than a king? Higher. Yeah, it's a three. Yes, higher. They're gonna go higher than a three. My man's sleeping, it's been a long vacation. Oh it my is gosh, higher, yes, it's a yes. queen. Lower. Lower than a queen? Six. Ah, oh, you Vanna White it, I love that. That was right in the middle. Um, higher or lower than a higher. six? Oh, look, it is. It's over there in the corner by that cute kid. Oh, higher. Gonna go higher than a seven. Let's see what it is. It is higher. Lower. Lower than a king. Let's see it. Yep, it's oh. a deuce. Higher, definitely yeah. higher, yeah. Let's see. It's low reveal. I like it, player. Lower. Lower. Lower, lower. than a nine. Let's see it. No, it's higher. So it ends here, we're at row 21. Nine right. Now, Joyful Leon has to beat nine if he wants to go to the Grand Canyon. So Tara, with the help of her husband, Robert, got nine right. That's a big number, but if anybody can beat it, nah, it's Joyful Leon. I can do better. You can do better. I like that confidence. All right, let's start with this first card, Leon. Good luck. Let's take a look. The first card, oh, deuce. Of course, higher. Higher than a deuce? Higher than a deuce. Jack. That's going to be lower than a jack. Lower than a jack. Let's see it. Lower. It's going to be higher. Higher than a four. Hey, it's Denny, your it's good buddy Denny over here. We're going lower now. Lower than that, good job, Denny. Good to see you again. All right, lower than a queen. Yep, there it is. Three is going higher. Higher than a three, what you got? All right. Six. Six, oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah, uh, I know, right? So far, so good. Higher. He says higher, is it higher? Oh, it's lower. That means Tara and Robert are our winners. Thank you for playing, Leon. Tara and Robert are going on an eight-day tour of Grand Canyon. Zion National Park, monuments, everything. It's going to be crazy. And we've had a great time on the game playing. Lots of winners, good times. We have fun playing games. My good boy, Denny, learned some things. Yogi Bear sidekick. Boo boo. At a boy. We'll see you next time. I'm Mark Wahlberg. Thanks for watching the game playing. We're getting there is all the fun. See you next time.
Was this round made to be an homage to both Let's Make a Deal and Card Sharks? I don't think so at all. I think it was developing some sort of game we could play on the airplane. The deal aspect was playing on the words of that they were cards. And almost all of those games were derivative of something. And so I don't think it was a purposeful homage, but an easy and fun way to have a bonus round. Before we get to the game, I just want to quickly talk about a show that many people probably recognize you from, Antiques Roadshow, which you've been hosting since 2006. Antiques Roadshow is thrilled to be finding tons of treasures in Portland, Oregon. Antiques Roadshow is seeing magnificent treasures at Meadowbrook Hall in Michigan. Antiques Roadshow has landed in Central Florida where the sky's the limit for great treasures. Has there ever been any talks of creating an Antiques Roadshow-based game show? I have been asked that every year of my career since I took that show as a host. I did a pilot for one. There have been many pitches that have come across my desk, but none that have really nailed it. And it's an interesting show. That show works the way it works, and if you change it, it doesn't work. But while it seems unnatural for a game, nobody's really been able to make that work and make it stick, in America at least. Don't worry, Mark. I'll come up with an Antiques Roadshow game show, and I'll send it to you. That sounds great. Do you ever get a chance to watch the appraisals on set? Yeah. When I was doing the show regularly, I don't travel with that show anymore. There were times in my day where I could watch some appraisals, but it was really interesting. I would be shooting my stuff while they were shooting their stuff, so those chances were a little few and far between. I would have breaks where I'd get to hang out at a table and see people who were making it on TV come and bring their stuff in and hang out for that process, which is 95% of what goes on there. But the stuff they're actually shooting, it's a pretty hectic day, so I was doing my stuff when they were doing their stuff. For you, how exciting is it to see someone find out that a painting they found in their attic is really a Picasso or their grandmother's vase is worth $10,000? When it's a big surprise, it's certainly the key to that show being on the air for 24 years. So it's exciting, and that never gets old. And it's very much like a game show in the sense that you're watching somebody's life change for the better. You're absolutely right about that. Well, Mark, we have reached my favorite portion of the game show, And it's always even more special for me when I get to create and host a game for someone that I've watched and looked up to since my childhood. Well, I'm glad to be a part of it, and I'm a little nervous, so let's play. There's no need for you to be nervous. You're going to do great. It's time for the Game of the Day. Game of the Day. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, I have created a Russian Roulette-themed game just for you to play, Mark. And this game is so inspired by Russian Roulette that I've decided to call it Radio Russian Roulette. Radio Russian Roulette. (laughs) Okay, let's play. And here's how Radio Russian Roulette works. The game is divided into three rounds, and each round plays just like the Russian Roulette bonus round from Season 2 of the show. There is a trivia portion and a Russian Roulette portion. For the trivia portion, you'll have 60 seconds to answer up to eight multiple-choice questions correctly. And the reason why it's not 10 questions is because you do have a disadvantage in that you cannot see the questions. So I figured as a way to balance out that disadvantage, you'll instead only need to answer eight questions. All of the questions will be game show related, and for every correct answer, you'll score one point. However, get all eight questions correct, and your score for the round will be 10 points. You'll then have a chance to double those points by playing Russian Roulette. Now, if you do give an incorrect answer, the round will not end, but for every incorrect answer you do give, an additional drop zone will be added to your Russian Roulette portion of the round, should you decide to play it, on top of the one automatic drop zone. But more on that when the time comes. Now, Mark, if you can score 20 points or more by the end of round number three, you will be deemed a winner, and the drop zone you're sitting on right now will not open. Those are all the rules. Mark, are you ready to play? I might as well jump in. Let's do it. Then let's play Radio Russian Roulette. And we're going to start with round one. And remember, Mark, you can pass on a question, and if time permits, I'll come back to it. 60 seconds are on the clock, and time won't start until I finish reading the first question. Good luck. Let's play the first round. Tic, tac, or doe, which of these can be found on dogs? Tic. Correct. Eubanks, Barker, or Cullen, which one of these hosts does not have the first name Bob? Bill Cullen. Correct. Pack, 
Peck or Puck? Who hosted the big showdown in Three's a Crowd? Peck. Correct. Match game, Hollywood Squares, or Password, which one features six celebrity guests per episode? Match game. Correct. On your mark, get set, or go, which was a game show hosted by Kevin O'Connell? I think on your mark. Incorrect. His mother, his sister, or his girlfriend, who was Tammy in relation to the whammy on the original Pressure Luck? Girlfriend. Correct. Under $2, exactly $2, or over $2. How much were the winners of the beauty show hosted by Rip Taylor paid? $2. Incorrect. Jim, Jeff, or John, which has never been the first name of a host of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Jim. Correct. That's eight. Stop the clock. You got six correct answers, which means you only got two wrong. And let me go back and reveal the correct answers to the ones you missed. On your mark, get set, or go, which was a game show hosted by Kevin O'Connell that was go. And under $2, exactly $2, or over $2, how much were the winners of the beauty show hosted by Rip Taylor paid that was under $2 because it's the $1.98 beauty show. Also, Eubanks, Barker, or Cullen, which one of these hosts does not have the first name Bob? You correctly said that it was Bill Cullen. Peck, Peck, or Puck, who hosted the big showdown and Three's a Crowd? You were correct in saying Peck because it was Jim Peck. And Jim, Jeff, or John, which has never been the first name of a host of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? That was Jim because the two hosts have been Jeff Foxworthy and John Cena. And before we move on, not too long ago, we sadly lost the legendary Rip Taylor. So I just want to say rest in peace, Rip. And thank you so much for all of the great game show memories you provided us over the years. So you got six points that round, which is very strong. Six out of eight, not bad. So now you have a decision to make. I have six cards in front of me. Because you got two questions wrong, I have to add two drop zones to the automatic one. So three of the cards are safe zones and three of the cards are drop zones. You can risk your six points you earn this round from your six correct answers to play Russian roulette and try to double those points to 12. However, if you do go for it and pick one of the three drop zones, you will lose those six points. So, Mark, what do you want to do? I think for the sake of gameplay, I'm going to go for it. That's what I love to hear, Mark. Best of luck. Let's unlock your zone. And for 12 points, let's play Russian Roulette. One, two, three, four, five, or six. Two. Number two is a safe zone. You just doubled your points. Wow. How about that? So you have 12 points. You need only eight more points, and you still have two rounds to go. Let's do it. So technically, if you get all eight questions correct in this round, you will have one. Let's go for that. Yes, let's go for that indeed. It's time for round two. 60 seconds is going back on the clock. Once again, time does not start until I finish reading the first question. Good luck, Mark. Let's play round two. Grand Slam, Touchdown, or Slam Dunk, which followed the number 50 in the title of a Tom Kennedy-hosted game show? Grand Slam. Correct. Black, white, or gray, who won a Daytime Emmy Award for hosting Just Men? White. Correct. The Chair, The Chase, or The Wall, which game show was hosted by John McEnroe? The Chair. Correct. Guiding Light, Young and the Restless, or General Hospital, which soap opera was the answer to Vanna White's first Wheel of Fortune puzzle? General Hospital. Correct. Silver Snake, Pink Elephant, or Green Monkey, which was the name of a game on Minute to Win It? Pink Elephant. Correct. A penny, a dime, or a dollar, what's the lowest amount on a regular game board of Deal or No Deal? A penny. Correct. Goodbye, good riddance, or good luck. What did Ann Robinson say to losing contestants on Weakest Link? Goodbye. Correct. Finn, Gill, or Scale, who hosted the 1990 version of The Joker's Wild? Finn. Correct. Stop the clock. You got all eight right. And not only did you answer all eight questions correct in that round, congratulations, Mark. You just won Radio Russian Roulette. (laughs) 
Yeah, proving I'm probably better as a contestant than as a host. No, not in my eyes. You are equally valued as both host and contestant. Thank you. And quickly, let me go back and explain some of the answers from that round. Grand Slam, Touchdown, or Slam Dunk, which followed the number 50 in the title of a Tom Kennedy-hosted game show? And you correctly said Grand Slam because the title was 50 Grand Slam. Black, White, or Gray, who won a Daytime Emmy Award for hosting Just Men? Again, you were correct in saying White, as in Betty White. And Silver Snake, Pink Elephant, or Green Monkey, which was the name of a game on Minute to Win It? You were right in saying Pink Elephant. And Silver Snake and Green Monkey... Both of those are team names from the Nickelodeon game show, Legends of the Hidden Temple. Rad fact! So with the 10 points you got in this round, you're up to 22 points. And you've already won, but just for fun, why don't we play Russian Roulette to see if you would have doubled your points for the round. Okay. So let's unlock your zone, and let's play Russian Roulette. Since you answered none of the questions incorrectly, you only have to deal with the one automatic drop zone. So with one drop zone and five safe zones, mark one through six, which number would you like to pick? Four. Number four is a safe zone. You just doubled your points again. So mark your score after two rounds is 32 points. Would you like to play the trivia questions of the final round to see how you would have done? Okay, let's play this final round. All right, here we go. You ready? Yeah. This is round three. 60 seconds is going back on the clock. And let's play Russian Roulette. $10,000, $20,000, or $30,000. Which dollar amount was never in the title of a version of Pyramid? 30000 Correct. What's my line? I've got a secret or to tell the truth. Which game show had a feature called The Mystery Guest? What's my line? Correct. The bedroom game, the shower game, or the closet game, which was the name of an actual pricing game featured on The Price is Right? The shower game. Correct. Bumper Stumpers or Bumper Stumpers, which was not the title of an actual game show? Bumpers. Correct. Clunk, Clank, or Zonk on the game show Treasure Hunt, what was a bad prize called? Clank. Incorrect. Johnny Carson, David Letterman, or Jay Leno, who hosted a game show pilot called The Riddlers? I think David Letterman. Correct. Huey, Dewey, or Louie, who hosted Family Feud from 1999 to Louie Anderson. Correct. Magnificent, Marvelous, or Monstrous, which adjective described the marble machine in the title of a 1975 game show? Marvelous. Incorrect. But just like the first round, you got six correct. So great job again, Mark. Well, thank you. And going back to the ones you got wrong, Clunk, Clank, or Zonk on the game show Treasure Hunt, what is a bad prize called? That's Clunk. And game show fans will know that a Zonk is a bad prize on Let's Make a Deal. Brad fact. And Magnificent, Marvelous, or Monstrous, which adjective described the marble machine in the title of a 1975 game show? That was Magnificent, as in the Magnificent Marble Machine. Also, Bumper, Stumpers, or Bumper Stumpers, which was not the title of an actual game show? You correctly said Bumper. Stumpers was hosted by Alan Ludden, and Bumper Stumpers was hosted by Al Dubois. Brad fact! And Huey, Dewey, or Louie, who hosted Family Feud from 1999 to 2002? You not only gave the correct answer, but you said the host's name, and that was Louie, as in Louie Anderson. But Mark, congratulations once again on winning Radio Russian Roulette! Thank you. I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, I enjoyed every moment of creating and playing this game with you. And that was the game of the day, Radio Russian Roulette. Radio Russian Roulette. Well, Mark, this has been such a thrill for me to talk with you about your game show career. So from my 22-year-old self, as well as from my 7-year-old self who first watched you on Russian Roulette, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the game show today. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm honored that you wanted to talk to me and grateful for all of your listeners. And as always, you have an open invitation to join me whenever you want to talk some more or if you just want to play another game. Thank you, Bradley. All right, Mark. Thank you again for inspiring me to want to become a game show host, and I look forward to seeing what's in store for you next. 
Well, my pleasure, man. And thank you so much, and good luck. All righty. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, unfortunately, the truth is we are out of time for this episode of The Game Show. My thanks once again to game show host Mark L. Wahlberg for being my special guest today. Now, if you've dropped in late when an episode of The Game Show is airing and you want to listen to that episode in its entirety, you can check out all of my episodes of The Game Show by logging on to www.soundcloud.com slash Bradley underscore Clark. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y underscore C-L-A-R-K-E slash sets slash The Game Show. That's www.soundcloud.com slash Bradley underscore Clark. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y underscore C-L-A-R-K-E slash sets slash The Game Show. Plus, don't forget to like The Game Show starring Bradley Clark on Facebook and follow The Game Show starring Bradley Clark on Twitter using the handle at The Game Show BC and hashtag The Game Show. But of course, be sure to tune in next time for another exciting episode of The Talk Show, all about the world of television game and competition shows, The Game Show. I'm Bradley Clark, the Bradster, and Mark, why don't you say the last line for me? Join Bradley Clark next time for the ultimate radio show about game shows. Until you listen to The Game Show again, this is Mark L. Wahlberg saying, remember, watch your step. Bye for now. This edition of The Game Show was created and produced by Bradley Clark and was recorded at the WRHU Studios. This is Austin Angelo speaking. The Game Show is a Bradley Clark production. Get your game on.